Okay, welcome to another Physios for ME podcast. This is one of a two-part series about the use of heart rate monitoring in activity management for people with ME. We've chosen this topic as we were aware that in our first 12 months, we produced a lot of information about what not to do with people who have ME, which is a really important message. But what a lot of physios were asking us is, okay, so what can we do? And, you know, we're physios as well, and our driving force is helping people. So we were keen to start exploring the approaches that we were being told were helpful. And we're hoping to continue to explore lots of topics in the coming months. Um, so I first heard about heart rate monitoring by reading the amazing work of the Workwell Foundation. Thank you, Todd, who we will introduce you shortly. Um, and then we heard from lots of patient experts who were already using heart rate monitors to help them manage their activity levels and avoid symptom exacerbation. So we're using this as a way for us to explore the subject in more detail. This part one will cover the theory and then part two will look at patient case studies and how it works in practice. It's really important to note that this is an informative piece, not a prescriptive one. All treatment for people with ME should be individual, constantly monitored and evaluated. It's not possible to produce a one-size-fits-all management guide. What we'll talk about here is meant to be an introduction to the topic, and then we'll have links to lots of other resources and support groups on the heart rate monitoring page on our website, which is physiosforme.com, where you can then go and explore the topic in more detail. So today we've got three members of Physios for ME and two special guests. Um, quick introduction, my name is Karen. I'm a neurological physio, so I use exercise in my practice with a focus on motor recovery. So I've strategically placed myself in the role of compare for today because my cardiorespiratory knowledge might have been a little bit rusty. So I'm hopefully going to translate what these clever people are going to be talking about for any physio who might be in the same position as me or anyone with ME who doesn't have that kind of background knowledge. Our other members from Physio uh, for ME are uh, Nicola Clay Baker. Um, Nikki, what's your background with regards to cardiovascular? Yeah, so um, I've got um, 30 years as a physio um, and my PhD was in um, cardiovascular training of stroke patients um, with some uh, quite a significant number of CPET testing for stroke uh, people with stroke. Um, and uh, I've learned a lot from the ME population about heart rate monitoring and obviously from Workwell as well. Um, so I'm really keen to, to share what, what I've learned. Great. And we also have Natalie Hilliard. And um, now with your academic background, this should be pretty easy for you, right? <laughs> oh, <laughs> so yeah, I did a sports science degree. Uh, I can't even remember when, back in the day. Um, and then I went on to do my physiotherapy degree. So actually, it's, this is a really interesting topic for me because it's taking me back to exercise physiology stuff that I had forgotten because we rarely use it within our physio practice. So um, I'm using heart rate monitoring with some of my ME patients. Um, and also now with some of the post-COVID patients. So, um, yeah, I'm really happy to be on this podcast. Good. Um, and our fourth member of our team, Michelle, uh, couldn't join us today, but she's working on a podcast of her own, so that she's, she's still being put to work. <laughs> <laughs> so we're delighted to also to be joined by Todd Davenport, um, who's joining us live from California. Um, Todd, it's Sunday tea time here, so can you introduce yourself and let us know if you've had breakfast yet? <laughs> My name is Todd Davenport. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I am a research consultant with the Workwell Foundation. Uh, I'm also professor and vice chair of the Department of Physical Therapy at University of the Pacific, which is in Stockton, California, uh, about an hour to an hour and a half without traffic east of the San Francisco Bay Area here in California. Uh, I've been working uh, in research related to fatiguing illnesses for about 20 years, uh, specific to ME uh, for the past, oh gosh, maybe 13 or 14 years. Uh, I've been a, phys a licensed physio here in California for the past 20 years as well. So have uh, my primary background in orthopedics and sports, uh, but do have a caseload of individuals that I am following with, uh, with ME and also uh, also post COVID. So I'm really excited to be on the podcast today. And thank you so much for having me. I just want to briefly give a shout out to my other Workwell Foundation colleagues, uh, Stacey Stevens, uh, Dr. Mark Van Ness, uh, Jared Stevens, and Dr. Chris Snell, uh, who are part of a fantastic team that uh, I really enjoy working with. And, and I'm excited to share some of our work. 
Fab. And thank you again so much for joining us um, on a Sunday morning for you. And then we also have, also from America, we've got Sue who's joining us. And um, Sue, we're going to find out a lot more about you in part two. Um, but Sue is a writer who has ME and has experience using heart rate monitors. So you might help us out here um, with some of your kind of insights as, as we go along in part one. And then we'll have a good chat with you in part two. But thank you for joining us, Sue, as well. You're um, East Coast, is that right? Yes, I'm yes. In, the, in the United States. So thank you for having me. Thank you for joining us. Um, so for part one, what we're going to talk about is um, Natalie is going to give us a refresher on kind of cardiorespiratory fitness and cardiopulmonary exercise testing while I take notes. <laughs> and then Pard is going to talk about the abnormalities in people with ME and the kind of rationale around heart rate monitoring. Um, and then Nikki will talk about the kind of principles of how to do heart rate monitoring, so to speak. So, Natalie, do you mind getting us going with a bit of uh, a refresher for me, please? <laughs> and for me too, Karen. Um, so, yes, yeah, so what is cardiorespiratory fitness or performance? Um, so it's, it's, it's the ability of the heart, the blood cells and the lungs to supply oxygen blood to the working muscle tissues for the ability of, of those muscles to use uh, oxygen to produce energy for movement. Um, it's conferred by the central capacity of the circulatory and respiratory system to supply oxygen and the peripheral capacity of the skeletal muscle to utilise oxygen. So what does that mean? <laughs> so, yeah, it's dependent on the things that are, are highlighted on this next slide. Healthy lungs, healthy heart, healthy circulatory system, healthy muscles, including the mitochondria, healthy brain and nervous system. So healthy lungs are really the ability of the lungs to take in oxygen from the air, diffuse the oxygen through the millions of tiny grape-like looking structures in the lungs called alveoli. So the alveoli or the air sacs as they're also called are only one cell thick which allows efficient diffusion of oxygen from the lungs into the bloodstream. And of course, the byproduct of respiration, carbon dioxide, is removed from the body via the diffusion of it from the blood back into the alveoli, where then we expire it out of our mass. So the capacity of the lung tissue to do this effectively um, and efficiently is a really important part of cardiopulmonary fitness. So in terms of having a healthy heart, we need a healthy heart to pump the blood efficiently through the body, target uh, to get to the target tissues, i.e. the muscles. Um, so, and, and part of that also is that the blood vessels need to be uh, efficient and working properly, carry that blood through the body. So, um, healthy muscles. And um, what do we mean by healthy muscles? So I think probably the most important part of the muscle are the mitochondria, which live inside the muscle cells. They're commonly known as the powerhouse of the cell, and it's most simplistic explanation, they're organelles that act like a digestive system, which take in nutrients, mainly glucose, breaks them down, creates energy rich molecules for the cell, namely ATP. So it's where we get our energy from. It's where we get our energy from to move. So for all of these individual systems to work, we also need a healthy brain and a healthy nervous system. So we kind of see this as the computer that drives the rest of the process. Um, although it's clearly not that simplistic. Um, so the central nervous system controls the heart, the lungs, all under our awareness or voluntary control. So 100 billion neurons speaking to each other to ensure the system works effectively together. So it's quite astonishing, really, when you, when you break it down. So how do we measure cardiorespiratory fitness or performance? Um, mostly... A cardiopulmonary exercise testing or CPEP to shorten it and um, it's mostly used by elite athletes and sports people to measure their cardiorespiratory performance over time although in the US as we now know it's uh, used by the Workwell Foundation to test people with ME and obviously Todd will be talking uh, way more about that. So it, it, simplistically the person is sat on a bike or sometimes a treadmill is used with various tubes and monitors and a 
face mask that measures the amount of expired carbon dioxide and it measures the amount of oxygen consumption. As the person cycles at a steady rate, with slow increases of resistance on the pedals, measurements are taken, such as blood pressure, heart rate, oxygen saturation levels, and the amount of expired carbon dioxide and oxygen. Um, and we know that carbon dioxide is the byproduct of exercise metabolism. So as the exercise levels gradually increase through resistance, the CO2, sorry, the CO2 levels also increase. So the point at which there is more carbon dioxide production compared to oxygen intake is called the ventilatory anaerobic threshold or lactate threshold. And you can see that on the graph. This is where cells start to produce significantly more lactic acid. There is too little oxygen to fuel the muscles. They start to work anaerobically, literally meaning without oxygen. We can only work anaerobically for short periods of time, although elite athletes can push themselves for longer anaerobically. So the exercise test stops at the point the person can no longer pedal anymore, which is why it's called a maximum exercise test. So I hope that makes sense. <laughs> that, was, that was a fantastic overview. Thank you so much for that. Um, I'd like to take the the overview that Natalie provided and then apply it to uh, cardiorespiratory performance in people with ME. Um, and some of the, the abnormalities that we see when we test folks uh, who have ME using uh, CPET. Um, using CPET, not, not just one CPET, but in, in our case, we use two CPETs that are spaced 24 hours apart. The first CPET is really to get a baseline and also serves as a stimulus to induce fatigue. It's a standardized stimulus, uh, but it's indexed to the patient. You can only pedal for as long and as, and as hard as you can. Um, so we're not giving a standardized dose of that stressor. We're giving the dose that's appropriate for the patient. Uh, and then we're coming back the next day, 24 hours later, and testing them again in the post-exertional state. Um, normally people can reproduce their exercise test results just fine. Um, you know, they're, they're, they may be a little sore and tired on that second day, but, uh, you know, all of the variables that you would measure, maximum heart rate, uh, cardiac output, blood pressure, heart rate, um, both at peak exertion and at ventilatory threshold are the same in people who do not have ME. But what's, what's interesting and what we think indicates the pathology in people with ME is that there is a reduction in maximum heart rate, a maximum heart rate, a reduction in maximum blood pressure, a reduction in maximum volume of oxygen consumed. And you also see this at that ventilatory anaerobic threshold that Natalie was talking about. And correspondingly, you see an increase in intracellular acidosis, suggesting that there is a metabolic dysfunction that's happening that's causing all of this instead of a psychological dysfunction or a psychiatric dysfunction. And so if we go to the next slide, this is data that we presented uh, at the 2020 Combined Sections meeting of the American Physical Therapy Association, uh, where we conducted a systematic review of uh, cardiorespiratory measures during a single cardiopulmonary exercise test. So these are single tests. And uh, I wanna draw your attention to a couple of numbers uh, in it kind of towards the, the, the leftmost third of the chart you'll see the, the N and the mean and standard deviation. For VO2, uh, there at the top, uh, you see that among the 975 patients, they had a, 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 v, a VO2 of 22 and a half. And among the 500 controls, they were up around 31.4, which is uh, robustly different statistically uh, and about uh, an effect size of, of sort of a threefold decrease. Um, we'll contextualize that in the, next, uh, in the next slide, but I just wanted to point that out to you. Uh, in addition, I, I want to point out the VO2 uh, at, at ventilatory anaerobic threshold. So among the 324 subjects, uh, patients, that VO2 was down to 13. And the, uh, among the controls, almost 150 of them was up around 17.8. So you can see that there's some pretty significant decrement, both at peak exertion and at that ventilatory anaerobic threshold that Natalie was talking about. Uh, 
But relevant to our discussion here, I want to point out the heart rates, which I've cleverly disguised. Oh, if we could go back just really quickly. I've cleverly disguised these in big red boxes on the screen. Um, so they're hard to hide. So if we go up to peak effort there, among the thousand and so patients at peak effort, you're at, up at 157 beats per minute at peak. That's not very high. Uh, for those of us who are used to uh, uh, you know, going out and, and walking and riding a bike and, and so forth, that, you, you run into that 157 at, at kind of a moderate level of aerobic exertion. Um, and the controls were up at 172, which is kind of, kind of low, um, but very, very different between the two groups. Uh, fifth, that 15 beat difference is very different. And if you go to ventilatory anaerobic threshold, which is the sub-maximal uh, level of exertion, um, notice we're at 125 for, the, for people with MECFS and 136 for controls. So again, very, very different, uh, which raises the importance of carefully monitoring heart rate because heart rates are so different between people with ME and age and uh, sex matched uh, control subjects. Um, because they're so different, this is another example of how ME is a, is a, is a disorder, is, a, is an illness that breaks all the rules. Uh, we can't just use normal cardiorespiratory monitoring uh, ideas on people with ME. So if we go to the next slide, I just want to contextualize this for you. So in the previous slide, we said uh, we were somewhere around 21 and a half for that maximal VO2 and the, the samples predominantly women. So this is actually from the American College of Sports Medicine. Um, what you'll notice is that uh, we're in the red boxes at the very bottom. We're at very, very poor uh, cardiorespiratory fitness. In fact, we're at less than one percentile of cardiorespiratory fitness for all of these individuals that were studied with ME. Um, and so you're talking about very severe uh, impairment in cardiorespiratory function. Uh, so it isn't a wonder that when patients come in, uh, they're demonstrating such a, and reporting uh, such, such terrible functional impairments uh, that affect every aspect of their lives. So if we go to the next slide, we're gonna look at some more systematic review data. This is from a previously published paper in uh, Frontiers in, in Pediatric Neurology. Um, this is looking at heart rates during a dual CPET. So these are the two CPETs spaced 24 hours apart. And the take home message of this slide is again, uh, at, at peak exertion, uh, we have very different heart rates happening uh, between people with ME and controls in terms of that percent predicted uh, based on the percent age predicted. Um, and if you look at ventilatory anaerobic threshold, um, you have fairly comparable um, heart rates on test one, but on test two, uh, the normal response is for people at ventilatory anaerobic threshold to kind of their bodies kind of figure out the test a little bit, uh, that bio, we, we see some improvements because of biomechanical efficiencies. Um, but we don't see that in the people with ME. So while the people with the, the control subjects get better, people with ME, they either stay the same or get worse. Uh, and so I think this is a really important concept to remember that the sub the submaximal heart rate uh, tends, to, tends to decline and tends to be lower. So again, this is a disease that breaks the rules and we can't use the same rules uh, as we would with, um, with someone who does not have ME. So on that next slide, um, this, is a, this is data from Lean and colleagues uh, that was published last year uh, on both tests. Again, all patients with ME have lower VO2 peak. Um, and on the second test of that two day test, you see an increase in lactic acid production just among the patients with ME. So not only uh, are we seeing uh, a, a, that metabolic abnormality, but we're seeing it get worse in the post-exertional state, which has high relevance for the kinds of symptoms and impairments that people are, um, that people are reporting. So if we go to the next slide, uh, why is this happening? Well, you know, there, there's a couple of ideas. There's lots of ideas. <laughs> we're just, we're scratching the surface on a couple of them here. Um, it could be related to cardiac changes, uh, such as orthostatic intolerance, um, maybe a, a neurally mediated hypotension, uh, and this is sometimes um, 
uh, or postural, uh, postural or orthostatic tachycardia syndrome or POTS. Um, so there's some blood pr pressure, heart rate dysregulation uh, occurring. Um, maybe some of the, mis the metabolic changes. There's changes in morphology of blood cells. There's mitochondrial damage and changes in mitochondrial enzymes. There's a reduction in ATP production, uh, as well as that dysautonomia. So there's a lot of sort of, I, I just sort of brushed over a really rich and evolving uh, literature in pathophysiology, uh, but it, it leads to probably what, what I would consider and what a lot of authors would consider a hallmark of ME, which is post-exertional malaise. And so post-exertional malaise is, is not just fatigue. So here you're seeing uh, data from 150 subjects uh, that uh, Lily Chu's group at Stanford had a chance to survey about their, their fatigue. Um, in the leftmost column, there is a whole host of different uh, symptoms that you see. So not only fatigue, but also poor concentration and difficulty thinking and poor memory, uh, but also muscle pain, joint pain, headaches, but also sore throat, tender lymph nodes, which kind of has to do with an idea that's been out there that um, you know, part of the pathophysiology of this, of this disease is related to uh, immune dysregulation, uh, flu-like symptoms, uh, and also um, sleep disturbances. Uh, in those middle columns, uh, they went ahead and contrasted physical exertion with emotional distress. So the likelihood of having the symptom with physical or cognitive exertion versus emotional distress. And um, what they found was that across the board, physical exertion uh, created greater um, far greater, in some cases, incidence of these symptoms than emotional distress. And so what this means is that physical and cognitive exertion is really something we have to watch. Uh, but we shouldn't, we also shouldn't sleep on emotional stress. Um, now, the fact that folks <clears throat> uh, demonstrated symptoms with emotional distress, again, doesn't mean that this is a psychological or psychiatric condition. Um, it's pretty well recognized that a lot of health conditions are either created or exacerbated by stress. And uh, some of the, um, the deficits of prolonged um, you know, autonomic activation. So there's a very physiological basis for those findings as well. Um, and so as we think about pacing programs, prescribing sort of thresholds for heart for your setting your heart rate monitor um, identifying the key symptoms are super important um, and so a clinical pearl that's going to foreshadow i think karen's um uh, i think karen's karen's second podcast is to uh is to really think about getting an idea of the patient's three chief symptoms uh, that you can build that pacing program around now, one of the things that, that uh, Dr. Chu's group did that was really interesting was that not only did they look at uh, measuring the, the symptoms and how frequently the symptoms occur, but they also looked at uh, how long does it take between the onset uh, or the, ac the aggravating activity and the onset of PEM. Um, and so it's very, very interesting that most of the time you're talking about either something that people are uh, having immediately or within one to three hours, um, you know, almost, almost everyone is within a day. Um, and so, so that's, that's interesting. And, and another interesting finding here that is really relevant to what we're talking about is the fact that it can vary. Uh, so in about 40% of people, uh, the, the length of time to PEM after exertion can vary widely. Uh, and so getting an idea from your patient about uh, their specific PEM characteristics is really important considering even the timing uh, between the activity uh, and the exertion. Now the duration of PEM uh, can vary. Uh, most, of, most folks are between a day and seven days. Uh, but notice down, down there uh, at the bottom, it can vary. Uh, again, in 45% of patients, 
And uh, the thing that's, that's all of this is concerning, of course, uh, but what's very concerning is that there are folks that are uh, more than three days and, and more, more than a week is about a quarter of the entire sample. So we'll want to really make sure that we watch our patients uh, and ask them how long their PEM symptoms last uh, and bearing in mind that there are some folks that have PEM symptoms and corresponding dysfunction, disability uh, for a long period of time uh, as we go forward. So if we go to the next slide, um, we have a hypothetical time course of PEM that we, that we, that we look at through WorkWell. Um, we, we think about the time course of PEM as being uh, some, some immediate symptoms uh, we think about them as having some short-term symptoms, and then we have we have those that are that are long-term, and we we hypothesize that uh, these correlate with varying levels of damage or, or exacerbation uh, related to um, impairment of the aerobic system. Um, so immediately, a uh, person may have fatigue; they may be out of breath; they may be dizzy; they may have nausea. Um, these are not totally unlike symptoms you might see in non-disabled folks, but for people with ME-CFS, they amplify over time instead of improve. Um, the short-term symptoms reflect overdoing, uh, the sh kind of short-term overdoing lasting two to four days, um, where folks spend a lot of time above that anaerobic threshold uh, or do or spend multiple times a day over that anaerobic threshold that exhausts the ability of the body to supply daily energy needs. And so these may include symptoms like muscle and joint pain, brain fog, headache and sleep disturbance, uh, and also start to reflect dysfunctional neurological and cardiopulmonary responses. And then finally, the long-term PEM symptoms these last a week or more, and they reflect a sustained immune response uh, that's consistent again with that damaged aerobic energy system. And these signs may include weakness, uh, significant decreases in function, flu-like symptoms, and other types of cardiopulmonary symptoms. So the take home for all of this is to say that um, in order to stay out of symptoms and stay out of the energy system that doesn't seem to be working well, um, patients with ME can use heart rate monitoring to stay under their ventilatory anaerobic threshold to manage that potential lactic acidosis and use an energy system that works. So the most accurate way of determining your ventilatory anaerobic threshold is to do a CPET. And of course, you know, as the WorkWell Foundation, we would, we would advocate um, doing the CPET uh, but if the CPET is not available, or sometimes people people can't do the CPET because it's just too it's too symptom aggravating, there are other ways to to be able to to approximate your ventilatory anaerobic threshold. So back in 2010, we wrote a position paper that was published in the journal Physical Therapy, and we put forward a basic guideline. And that basic guideline is to calculate 55% of your maximum heart rate. And that, that's right around your ventilatory anaerobic threshold. And I'll, I'll talk about that here in just uh, more in just a second. But first, the mechanics. So you would do 220 minus your age times 0.55. And that would be about your ventilatory anaerobic threshold. So if you're 30 years old, your VAT is about 105. So you would set your heart rate monitor to beep every time you were over that 105. And if you're 45, then you're, you're, you're kind of right around that, that 96 beats per minute. Um, and so you'd set your heart rate monitor to beep at 96 beats per minute. And the, the aim is to keep this below the threshold uh, when you do your activities. And, and so it's a place to start. Um, there's an expression, all models are wrong. Some models are useful. And uh, so we had our 55% threshold tested empirically recently. Uh, it was, it was a, an article published back in May. Uh, and uh, what they found was that actually people's ventilatory anaerobic thresholds were slightly greater than the 55% approximation. Uh, and so I do wanna point out that the reason for the 55% calculation is not to try and identify, not to try and pin down specifically what somebody's VAT is, but rather it's trying to identify VAT, provide a safety margin below that, um, and so we ideally would want to be below. So, and in fact, in a, in a secondary analysis of that data, we found that about 85% of the time, 
um, this, this formula undershoots the VAT, which is great. Uh, and so uh, this is actually, I think, I think this formula is doing its job. So there's an alternate way to calculate uh, ventilatory anaerobic threshold. And so that would be using uh, 206 minus 88% of your age and then, and then 55% of that. So you can see the calculations on the screen. And so these are slightly different, but again, uh, for, for women, this is a, 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 a um, more updated uh, and probably more, uh, more specific uh, formula to be able to use. Right, shall I carry on? Thank you, Todd. Brilliant. So um, obviously a lot of evidence base for people with ME up until this point. Um, now the, the work that we've got in the rest of this PowerPoint is based on um, work that people with ME themselves have um, identified. So a lot of this information is from a, a Facebook page set up by Angela Flack and Catherine uh, Dickerson, who are both in the uh, have contributed to the second podcast um, but they've done a lot of work themselves on trying to find how it works and of course Sue has produced a lot of information as well um, so a lot of a lot of this is not being researched but certainly um, I would I would certainly state that this is very useful information and hopefully we can do more research on this to, to establish whether whether um, this applies to everybody with T, uh, with ME but certainly some people uh, use alternative methods to calculate the anaerobic threshold um, so some people use 60% of their maximum heart rate some people will start at 100 beats per minute as their anaerobic threshold some people will start um, 10 to 20 percent you know setting their, their anaerobic threshold at, at uh, 10 to 20 percent of their, their resting heart rate and just trying to stay within that as much as possible and um, some people zone so they um, start with their resting heart rate and try and stay within these easier to easy to moderate zones throughout the day the over 24 hours um, and trying to keep within that 10 to 20 percent of, of resting heart rate so these blue and yellow zones rather than pushing uh, any any closer to their anaerobic threshold and this is an example that <clears throat> Angela uh, on, on their Facebook page has used to demonstrate how their heart rate monitors have identified when they've sat within their zones or when they haven't sat within their zones so a bad day uh, has been calculated from this graph and obviously a much better well-paced day identifying staying within the zones People with ME tend to use auditory or visual alarms to tell them whether they're going too close to their anaerobic threshold. Um, but obviously that's not uh, suitable for everybody who somebody that might get quite anxious with alarms might need to um, just be checking less regularly. Right? But it's, it's, it's really something that's quite personal for people with, with ME and certainly, Susan, would, do you use alarms for your did you use your alarm? I do. I set my alarm for a couple of beats per minute below my AT. And then, um, you know, and then I know when I'm approaching it and I need to slow down and bring my heart rate down. Yeah, yeah. Um, the difficulties come when people have other, um, like Todd has mentioned, other um, diagnoses, particularly orthostatic intolerances. And I know that everybody that um, we've got talking on the next podcast has um, POTS particularly, which, which has proved to be quite significant for the majority of people um, that we've talked to using heart rate monitors. Um, and it, it is estimated, it some, depends what you read, but up to 75%, even 80, 90%, um, depending on what you read, that, that there are people, people with ME have got these orthostatic intolerances related to dysautonomias. Um, and of course, because of this, as they try and do any activity, this even minor exertion will cause the heart rate to go over anaerobic threshold. Um, and most people that we've talked to do tend to use beta blockers to try and keep um, their heart rates in a reasonable zone to allow them to, to do activities and keep below the anaerobic threshold. Um, and again, PEM does tend to increase their POTS as well. So we would, if, if you, uh, there are certain tests that you can do, and I would advise you to go to the www.potsuk.org 
website to get more information about managing pots in particular, which which can be quite debilitating when you're trying to do heart rate monitoring. Other difficulties, trying to um, do certain activities can cause a definite increase in your heart rate. So anything with your arms above your head, using your core muscles, um, bearing down, sneezing, or just standing still can actually cause a lot of increase in heart rate. So being aware of that, you can then adjust your activities and adjust your rest periods in, that in order to allow you to keep that heart rate in a, in a, in a reasonable zone. And depending on the person, stress, heat, dehydration, air pressure, humidity, all these things on the right can have an effect on heart rate. And again, being aware of that and using heart rate monitoring to know what stresses you, to know what affects your heart rate will help you manage your heart rate much more effectively. Um, the benefits of heart rate monitoring, there's definitely a good amount of benefits. Um, and these are listed on this website here. Um, but um, you obviously the keeping below the anaerobic threshold, as Todd has mentioned, the, import, the, the importance of reducing potential acidosis is, is really important. Using an alarm to help you keep below that anaerobic threshold. And it can help you determine if you're going into post-exertional malaise. Um, certainly looking at your resting heart rate, if it's too high or too low, then it can give you an indication for the rest of the day. Um, increasing awareness of how hard your, um, hard your heart is working. And I think this is really key for the physios working with people with ME or post viral fatigue syndrome, that you know, you've know you got some, some solid data here to, to demonstrate that, that people's systems are struggling. And I do think this is so important for people to get validation of their, their problems, but also you know, to, to, to actually make sure that medics and, and, and allied health professionals are actually listening to their problems. Um, it's a stimulus for people with ME and, and post viral fatigue syndrome potentially to recognise the need to rest and when to rest and how effective the rest is being. And you can start to see patterns. So this um, uh, chart from WorkWell is really useful to demonstrate that uh, obviously certain activities are pushing this person below, uh, sorry, above that anaerobic threshold and those activities might be things that you need to adapt and change or pace or um, prioritize or plan so that you don't push yourself too hard into into zones that are not not where, where you should be so that's your heart rate and your um, setting your your heart rate uh, limits but some people actually use heart rate variation which um, is a new concept that um, has only been sort of researched, I believe, since the since year 2000. And it started with athletes um, and it's been developed by Marco Altini. And uh, so if you want to learn more about that, I do suggest you um, Google Dr. Marco Altini and find out a little bit more about heart rate variation. Um, but it's basically the variation in the time interval between each heartbeat in milliseconds. And generally, you would expect quite a variable uh, variation. So there should be constant variability in this heart rate variation. Um, so when the healthy body responds to stress, there should be lots of variability. And it is actually a non-invasive mark of the autonomic nervous system activity. And the, um, uh, the, the software that produces the information produces these two forms and I don't need to go into detail about what they are but it's based, these are basic markers of the parasympathetic system. You might be aware that the autonomic nervous system is made up of sympathetic and parasympathetic um, systems and um, an increased heart rate variation this shows that the uh, and a, sorry, the autonomic nervous system is, is working much more effectively. So we want a, a variable heart rate variation. That's what we're looking for. So on average, these uh, pieces of software will calculate your heart rate variation and elite users will have a, a variation around about 63. Um, but people with ME can go as low as eight, especially when they're in PEM. And there's some research looking at people with COPD and CHF, and they found that they have um, heart rate variation between 20 and 30, so still, still significantly lower than where it should be. In a healthy person, as they deep breathe, 
that drops their heart rate and increases their heart rate variation, which trains the parasympathetic system. And Marco Altini produced a program called Heart Rate Variation via Feedback, um, which basically works to train that, that system to try and improve the, the parasympathetic um, system to reduce the stress levels for athletes in particular. And the research with athletes is, is not significant as yet, and as I'm not aware of very, very much research within people with ME either, but um, certainly anecdotally, again, particularly people with severe ME seem to use heart rate variation a lot. Um, to, to work out how, how their system is their particular, and to try and train their parasympathetic system. When people are impaired, it appears that the system changes and that deep, deep breath raises their heart rate and drops the heart rate vari variation as they lay still. Um, their heart rate variation still drops rather than raising it and shallow breathing raises the heart rate variation. So it does seem to vary with people with ME. And how people with ME use heart rate variation. So the software, as I say, will, add, will calculate an average heart rate variation. Um, and then they'll look at how it varies from day to day, seven days a week, and even monthly comparisons to determine how their body is compared to the previous day. And certainly some people use overnight heart rate variation to show their quality of sleep. And all this information then helps them to adjust what they're doing in, in, in the following day so that they um, don't potentially push themselves into pen. Um, and they, it can be useful to demonstrate the benefit of rest, which sometimes heart rate can't, won't change as a result of rest, but heart rate variation will change as a result of rest. Um, it needs to be measured at the same time each day in the same position, ideally lying down and in the morning. And some people take readings before and after standing. And if a large vari variation is seen, then they, it's a measure for them that it could be a bad day. So warning signs to summarize really that if the resting heart rate in the morning is 8% more than it should be, that's a warning sign that perhaps uh, they're, they're shifting into a PEM state or heart rate variation if it's very low in the mornings, it's a potential indication as well. And then the importance of rest. Some people, and I know Workwell had suggested, rest three times as long as the activity takes. I know anecdotally, people with uh, ME have said it could be up to six times you need to rest as long as the activity is taken. So just a quick, because um, I know we do get a lot of people asking about which heart, what, what heart rate monitors should they get. Obviously, as physios, we can't endorse any particular product. We can just give you sort of a, a variety. And if you start looking and searching on the internet, you find lots and lots of monitors. Um, but the difference mainly is whether you use a ch chest strap or you, or you don't, whether you use a chest strap that um, communicates with a watch um, or with your phone. So um, I know that these two chest straps are still um, one of the one of some of the best um, that will help to and they link with most um, most phones so that will produce a good amount of data in terms of your heart rate it will allow you to set alarms and produce graphs and ideas of how your heart rate is responding over days and as I say they do respond well with most phones being aware that chest straps do wear out um, after about four to six months if you're wanting to add in heart rate variation, you need to think about the, um, the apps that you're going to use and whether they're compatible with the phones that you have. And certainly this um, website is a useful website. This is when I was talking about Marco Altini. This is the website he's worked with and the, the um, research that he's done related to heart rate variation. One of the people with ME that we've talked uh, to about this, she uses this um, App, um, because she likes to get a lot of sleep data and the heart rate variation overnight. Uh, another lady talked about this aura ring, which is really useful for gathering overnight heart rate uh, variation data as well. If you can't cope with a chest strap, obviously you'll need to rely on wrist-based watches. And again, these are being these are developing now, and there's there's a lot of uh, advances in in the, the data that wrist-based uh, heart rate monitors can provide. 
um, but a lot of the time they don't provide heart rate variation. So again, if you're wanting to look at heart rate variation, best to perhaps consider a chest strap and an app on your phone. Um, so these are a list of different um, risk-based um, watches, heart rate monitors that people with ME have used and found beneficial. And I know that Sue um, and Sue and Jenny, who's going to speak next time, uh, have used the Myo Alpha, and Eleanor has used the Polar A370. And the key message they wanted to get across: Can you cope with a chest strap? If you can't, use a wrist-based watch. Think about whether it's waterproof. Think about the battery life, and think about if you want an alert, does it provide an alert? I did a quick look at costings of some of these. Um, and because again, we do get asked about which ones are more expensive and is it worth getting these more expensive ones. And there is um, a review this year um, in, in this CC mag that has produced some really useful comparators. And um, really just to finish off, I'm just gonna flick up some of these additional sites and information for you to stop the podcast. And if you want any further information, about references. We will put, put this information on our website, www.physiosforme.com. Um, but just if you want to have a quick look at these now, and then we'll just finish off with Karen. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, so from, from what I've been listening to then, we've basically been saying that people with ME have got severe impairment in their cardiorespiratory function. Um, and we've talked to us about this um, ventilatory anaerobic threshold, which is the point where the body stops using oxygen to create energy. That's correct. So with some helpful nods. Um, and that's the, that's the point that we're kind of wanting to avoid because when we go beyond that, that's where we're going to be creating post-exertional malaise. Is that good? Good. And we want to avoid post exertional malaise because obviously that's the exacerbation of symptoms. The danger is though that because of the delay, um, you're not necessarily, you're going to find out almost too late that you may have overdone it. So heart rate monitor is a way of having almost like a real time measure um, of how your body's responding to an activity that you're doing at that time. Um, and it, I think it'd be useful, it, it's obviously useful for people with ME. I think it'd be useful for physiotherapists to employ as well if they're doing any kind of work with people with ME um, because particularly those um, with severe ME, um, some talk about kind of manual therapies being helpful but others have said it's they respond poorly to it and it, it could be perhaps you know could we use heart rate monitors as a way of measuring real time someone's response to your hands-on treatment, to a passive stretch, or even to just um, a subjective assessment of talking to you. It could just be that kind of real-time um, alert that you're starting to push that person too far. Um, so yeah, the, the um, heart rate variation uh, was, was a really interesting bit there, Nikki, and I think obviously we'll put lots of these links onto the website. Um, but overall, it sounds like we've we've got this real impaired cardio respiratory system and we've also now got a very objective way of measuring it in order to help people pace their activities and manage um, themselves. Would you say that's an accurate sum, Sue, of, of your experiences? And you're going to talk to us in lots more detail shortly, but um, would you say that's a very accurate summation? Yes, yes absolutely. Um, I would point out that using a heart rate monitor is only one piece of what physios should understand when working with ME patients. Um, I, I've written some guidelines because I've had to go to physical therapy a couple of times for injuries. And um, yeah, I found it helpful to educate the physical therapist about what ME is and how it affects me, so. That's a, that's a good point, isn't it? Because we don't want to get focused just on one element of what is a vastly complex um, condition and very individual as well, which is why we're saying at the start, what, what with all of this is, it can't be blanket applied, can it? It has to be so individualized. Mm -hmm. Lovely, well, thank you very much um, everyone for joining us, especially to you two um, calling in, in Sunday morning. Um, really, really appreciate your time. 
um, and hopefully that's been of interest. We'll, we'll be covering other topics in the future. So um, if anyone has any interest in a new topic, please let us know. We, we will be starting to explore. I'm sure, Todd, we will um, steal you at some point in the future because uh, it's fascinating to listen to you. <laughs> Thank you. That's fantastic. I, I really appreciate being on today. Thank you. Okay. Well, for then, we'll say bye for now. Bye.